hello Adam welcome to the podcast it's really nice to have you and uh how are you doing today great I'm speaking to you so it's already a good day it's early where I am a little later where you are let's but, uh, um I'm an what, early what, morning what are, guy anyway what are the times um for people like I know it's 3 p.m here in the UK what, what time is it there for you 10 a.m so I guess we've got a five hour difference yeah so this is like my peak performance time yeah, so of the day 3 p.m feeling... i'd be a little slower so i'm glad you're... that you're doing it at three and not me <laughs> yeah i know i know i know i think i think as well that's always going to be the way if i interview um um north american guests and stuff but uh because i normally flag probably uh maybe halfway through this interview <laughs> and then onwards my batteries are drained so we'll see i'm doing okay at the moment i've got my cup of tea um and uh, we should be fine but um yeah well mate it's really uh a privilege actually for you to have responded to my email and have actually said yes to and agreeing to come on the podcast because I think uh, for me definitely but probably for a lot of the world I would say if they've ever gone onto YouTube and looked for any sorts of mushroom foraging or those kinds of videos undoubtedly your videos would have popped up so um, I know that I've got a lot of value from them and I and um, just was very inspired um, not only from, you know, learning about everything that you teach, which is very super helpful, but also in the back of my my mind as well. I've always had this like, you know, I can't quite put my finger on it, but feel like I need to be producing content. And, you know, and then over the few years, it's become, OK, oh, I've discovered what my passion is. It's become clear. It's mushrooms. Let's produce mushroom content and stuff. And so in that regard, also. And the fact that you've turned it into a business and all this sort of stuff, you know, I found you you're very inspirational. Um, and I would say even, I didn't even share this with you up front when we were but, you know, as cheesy as it might sound, I would say you're one of my, uh, my one of my heroes uh, in the foraging world. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, I really appreciate you coming on. And, um, and yeah, I just wanted to, to you know, um, say that and express my gratitude and, uh and yeah, let, let's do this. Um, I do have a bunch of questions for you um, because I'm, you know, um, very curious about, you know, certain things. I've also opened it up to my, some of my audience and they've said uh, they've thrown a few questions at me as well. So I've got a couple of rapid fire ones at the end for you. But uh, without further ado, and stop myself from talking because I'm getting a bit excited here. Um, could you just share a little bit about, you know, who who is Adam Harrington um, and where where did you grow up? And where are you now, I guess? Well, first, thanks for saying that, the whole hero thing. I didn't know a mushroom person could become somebody's hero, but I guess I have some mushroom heroes as well. But thanks, that means a lot. Uh, so I run a business called Learn Your Land, and I do create mushroom content. I also create plant content and tree content. And I like doing it that way because, you know, originally I got into mushrooms, I think right at the same time I got into plants. But I started putting out a lot of mushroom content. And then when you start leading walks and you take people foraging for mushrooms, you inevitably run into those days where you just don't find much at all. And then people get disappointed. And so my way around that was, oh, I'll teach people also trees and plants and some other things that I was learning at the time and that I'm still learning. And so it's a good thing to kind of broaden your interest when you're leading these kinds of walks so that not everybody is disappointed whenever it's been a dry spell. Uh, but yeah, I've been creating content for some time. I got into this maybe 10, 11, 12 years ago, mostly through food and nutrition. Uh, so I was hungry for knowledge, but I was also hungry for the food. I was interested in eating healthy and putting healthier foods into my body. And for the first time in my life, I realized that something was calling me towards a certain direction, like down a path. Everything up until that point in my life was pretty much automatic. There's a lot of things that I inherited from my parents or from my peers, you know, just hanging around them and just kind of going with the flow. And not to say that a calling isn't part of the flow, but this is almost like a conscious decision that something is pulling me in some direction. I should follow this. And it was really exciting. It was basically the call of the woods or the forest and the fields to get me out there. And I didn't know originally why at first. I mean, I was getting into healthy eating. But when I was out there, I thought, you know, I bet a lot of this stuff is edible. And so I just started learning one species at a time. 
And I still approach my learning that way, one species at a time. And it's slow, it's deliberate, it's intentional, but it pays off in the end. And I love sharing this information with other people. I mean, I remember maybe a decade ago being out in the woods on a trail and thinking, I wish I could share what I'm feeling right now with other people. Not even just teaching them like, this is what this tree is. This is what this mushroom is. This is what this plant is. That stuff is exciting, but I just wanted to share how I was feeling out there with people. And I had a real like crummy little camera, like a digital camera at the time. And I think I might've filmed like chanterelles or something. And I don't even know if I put it on the internet, but I thought I'd like to do this. And I guess something listened and said, okay, you can do this. So I just started doing it. Uh, so I just started putting stuff on YouTube and now I have a channel, Learn Your Land, where I post uh, all the content that I have minus the proprietary stuff that I teach through online courses. That's awesome. Can, can you dig into a little bit about the, um, the calling like, uh, and also what was the path that you were on before this calling and this this um oh actually i I, i'm i want to go down this way you know what was it that happened was there a eureka moment for you um you know did you just were you always going out into the woods and then it just suddenly ramped up or you know the uh, the curtain was revealed to your passions or how how did that unfold for you over time so I did grow up with some experience in the outdoors. I had a patch of woods right behind my house, fortunately. It wasn't very big, maybe three acres. But I would go in there with my brothers, sometimes friends. But it was never to engage with nature. It was mm. to use nature for something, almost as like a backdrop to hang out and spend some time. So I'm fortunate that I actually had that and that I didn't have like helicopter parents that were always wondering where I was and trying to get me back in. They let me do all that stuff. And I camped a couple of times and I ate a couple wild berries here and there, but it was never serious. Growing up, it was all music, sports, and academics. Nothing really nature related as far as like being very intentional with nature, but it was, it was food. And what got me into food actually, like being intentional with diet and nutrition, personal health problems. And, and they're not extreme things. It's not like I was dying at the age of 16 or 17. But, you know, when you're 19, 20, 21, you look in the mirror and you see your complexion isn't as clear as you would like it to be, or your hair doesn't look as good as it should be, or you just don't seem vibrant, even though you're only 19 or 20. To me, that was almost like a wake up call. And I don't know why it was. Maybe it was just my ego saying, you don't look good. You can look better. But that's what got me into researching food. And so I just started trying different diets and reading a bunch of things. And fortunately, a lot of the nutritionists early on that I studied from also talked about wild foods. And I guess if I didn't study from those people, I probably wouldn't be so obsessed with wild foods today. But the calling wasn't like one day I woke up. It was little by little. It was almost just like a feeling that just kept building and building and building. And I couldn't suppress it anymore. You know, I used to hang out in a lot of urban environments and I still like walking through those environments. I mean, there's a lot of neat things to see in those particular places, but the wild places always just felt different. They just felt more magical to me. And I know that's not a scientific term. Like you can't say magic when you're discussing something like uh, mycology or botany, but you know, I'm not a professor. I don't have anybody that's going to fire me after saying such a thing. So I can say that on behalf of my business but it felt magical to be out in the woods and I just listened to that feeling and never abandoned it and I'm not so sure that it's wise to always follow one's intuition because I think it can lead somebody down some pretty dark paths and not to say that it's all been like sunshine and rainbows for me like I've been led down some pretty dark paths but it's been more beneficial than harmful to do such a thing and so I do trust my gut instincts a lot of the time over what other people say, unless I really trust the person. Nice. And, and a question that I've always thought about when I hear people talk about wild foods and, you know, I've been on wild food foraging courses, you know, do lots of research as well and, um, and all this sort of stuff. But so using your, what you've learned about wild foods, 
is the same wild food ingredient that you find in the wild better than the same species you know that's produced in the in the in the farms or whatever and and you know because i've heard people say that wild foods um have so much more nutritional content more nutritional value and um i guess playing devil's advocate i'm looking you know a leaf is a leaf and like literally how much more nutritional content could it have in even if it's the same leaf um but i wonder if you can speak to that um through your research whether you've actually uncovered that to be true or, or not yeah so what do you think of the domestication process what are people really doing they're making something more palatable they're making something maybe more edible more uh or i should say less toxic because a lot of times through the domestication process you're breeding out toxins and you're essentially making something more dependent on a caretaker if you're domesticating something so if you think about it you're making something a little weaker which is why you don't really find broccoli just like growing in the woods or like a red pepper growing in the woods now you will find wild brassicas for sure and they taste differently and you will find wild nightshades for sure and they taste differently and some of them are very toxic but through the domestication process you basically need somebody to take care of these mm. and inherently that is a weakening of that particular species and there have been studies not on every single wild food because there's just not a lot of funding for these kinds of studies but there are studies on different fruits for example wild blueberries versus cultivated blueberries or the wild cranberries versus the cultivated ones showing that they have higher levels of phytonutrients like antioxidants and terpenes and maybe saponins not saying all these things are always good every single time for humans or that they can absorb them and do something with them but it seems that in many cases a lot of these phytonutrients are stronger and they have to be because these are also plant defenses to protect them against extreme sunlight if they're growing out in the sun or against predation from other herbivores but if you put something in a fence or in a garden and you're taking care of it, it doesn't need to have all these defenses like it would in the wild. So you're getting rid of a lot of these things. I like wild foods. I also like domesticated foods. I eat meat. I eat vegetables. I eat from all kingdoms of life. But I can tell you that I feel different when I eat wild foods. Mm -hmm. And if you think of something like a wild animal, like here we've got white-tailed deer. We've got a lot of white-tailed deer. And you think about its lifestyle in the wild. Now, I know there's a lot of suburban deer, so maybe this isn't the best example. And they'll just sometimes walk right up to you. Those aren't the same ones that are growing out in like the Pennsylvania wilds. I live in the state of Pennsylvania, where they have to combat a lot of different threats on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, even. You know, if they let their guard down, they're going to be snatched up. And so something like a cow that's raised on a farm where feed is always presented to it. And there's really no threat to that cow, except for the human that's eventually going to take its life if it's going to be turned into beef or if something's going to happen to it. Something like that is inherently going to be a weaker animal if you just think about its lifestyle. And so the foods that I wanna put into my body, I want a strong body. So it makes sense to me to put in stronger foods. And mm -hmm. to me, the wild foods are stronger. This isn't always borne out in the research, like I said, just because there isn't funding on a lot of this. But when people eat wild foods and you talk to them, they'll tell you that there's a difference. Yeah, it makes it makes me think of um, you know survival of the fittest, you know, and and and, and even on a uh, personal development human perspective, you know, people who suffer come out stronger. You know, if you if you're going into like. Um, you know to run a marathon you have to train you have to suffer and you become out you come out stronger it's like uh you know these foods if they're in those environments they have to as you mentioned yeah i, I just think you just described it really well and, and i wouldn't be able to add anything more to the, the the way that you described it but um no that's that's really really good and um so what what what's in your cupboard at the moment fridge food cupboard and have you got any wild foods that you've stocked up at the moment or what was the last thing you've um eaten that was wild yeah um, if anybody is not into eating meat they might get mad at me 
I think, you know, a lot of people watch my channel. I talk about plants a lot and they assume I'm a vegan. <laughs> I used to eat the vegan diet, uh, but it didn't do my body very good. It actually kind of damaged my body in many ways. Yeah. So I had to go back to eating meat, but I tried it for a while. And then people will argue, yeah, you didn't do it right. I think I did it right. I mean, I tried, I did all different kinds of variations. I gave it a real good shot. I study with nutritionists. I think I knew what I was doing. It just didn't work optimally for my body. Having said all that, I'm stocking up on squirrel right now. Wild gray squirrel. I love it. I love it so much. And yesterday I had a meal uh, of wild squirrel and deer liver. And it was wow. so good. You know, you don't need that much because it's so nutrient dense. But I'm fortunate where I live that we've got excellent hunting seasons. And right mm -hmm. now we're recording this in October, which is prime hunting season in Pennsylvania. And so you can go out for a lot of different animals. I'm newer to the hunting lifestyle. So I don't uh, partake in many of the hunting seasons that are available to me right now. Uh, but yeah, the squirrel with the venison, but there are also my talking mushrooms in there or hen of the woods. Mm -hmm. So it was truly, truly a wild meal. And uh, it did my body very good. <laughs> I still have a lot of it left. So that's probably what I'm most excited about lately. But it's mushroom season here. I mean, I guess technically every month you can find mushrooms, but the fall here in Eastern yeah. North America, it's really a good time, especially if there have been ample rains. Uh, so my talkie, we've been stocking up on that as well. It's also nut season. So there's hickory nuts, there's black walnuts, there's butternuts, there's so much fruits as well, but there's only so much that one person can do. And yeah, one of yeah. the struggles of being a forager without a community that supports the foraging lifestyle is you realize you can't do it all. And you realize it was never about one person doing everything. It was always a community effort. And so there's like some grief involved with the foraging process when you hit that point and realize that you just can't do everything. But some years, you know, I guess that's why certain trees put out, that's not why the trees put out certain crops every single year or take some years off for the human to partake in every year or take a year off but it's neat that not everything is available every single year sometimes things are more abundant so that's a good time to you know hone your skills maybe an acorn processing if it's a good year maybe one year the butternuts will be fantastic or maybe one year the nanny berries will be fantastic so you can really focus on those wild foods awesome um how about you what's what's uh in season now for you guys so uh, oh, obviously yeah. a lot of mushrooms are in season uh i went out and did a big forage this morning uh with with buddy and spent about four hours trawling through in some new woods actually um and i've actually it was amazing as soon as i got off the path within about two minutes um you know it was mainly coniferous um woodland but i always like to see um fly agarics not only because they're, you know, very pretty to look at, but, you know, normally they're quite a good indicator mushroom. But this time I saw, I don't think I'd ever seen more of them than I did this morning. And um, I just ended up going off the path, even though the trees were like literally this far apart and I had to like duck and weave, I just did it. But um, anyway, I digress, but it was just a, a, a magical little walk this morning. But I was going to ask you actually, um, so, and, and, by the way, I'm I'm no expert on all the Latin names and, and everything, but relatively okay with some of the common names. And hopefully they transfer to um, the US without too much. Um, so saffron milk cap. Uh, well, I'm 99.9% I'm, I'm, I'm sure this saffron milk cap, but I wanted to bring it up because I've never eaten it. And uh, I actually, this raises two questions. Um, and I'm sure in America, there's a lot of like uh, fungi phobia, you know, people are a bit hesitant about even going out and foraging for wild mushrooms and then eating wild mushrooms. And, uh, and especially here in the UK, there's huge mycophobia, whatever, um, people not wanting to eat wild mushrooms. And, and although I'm a mushroom lover, you know, I love mushrooms, I love finding mushrooms. It Whenever I sort of break through a new barrier and go and explore a new species and then for the first time I'm eating that first species I do find a little slither of uh mycophobia just creeping in and uh, you know I'll be a bit hesitant eating that first plate of food that I cook up because oh, I've not done it before what if I'm wrong I don't know but um anyway I have that same feeling with these but uh, I um I also just wanted to ask you whether you have a similar 
thing going on in your head whenever you're tr um, ex tasting uh, new species or anything with it, when it comes to mushrooms. Um, and then I wanted to ask you how you would cook these if, if you cook those normally. So when I'm trying a new species, I guess the fear isn't as great as it used to be. Yeah. So I haven't been doing this forever. So I'm still newer to this hobby compared to some people who have been doing this their whole entire life. I remember in the beginning, I mean, it was 100% fear. It was, I'm not going to eat any wild mushroom unless I see somebody else doing it. And then slowly it became like, okay, I'll email somebody or I'll call somebody and describe it or I'll post a picture online and I'll trust that ID to the point where I really trust my identification when I'm foraging wild mushrooms. But I'm not like a crazy forager either. I mean, there are, I've tried, I don't know how many species I've eaten. I've eaten a lot, but there's probably only 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 that I really enjoy. And so I'll leave a lot behind. And I've become pickier and pickier over the years. Meaning if it's not like a prime specimen of something, I'm not even going to bother. Like it's not, to me, it's just not worth it just because of the taste, the texture, and it might be rotten. You know, early on when people are foraging chicken of the woods, and this is true for me, I would forge like the biggest fanned out ones that are like so dry and almost like cardboard. And they've got so many maggots in them, but it's chicken of the woods and I found it, you know? And I'll bring it home and I'll cook it and convince myself that this is like the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. It's a great learning experience. But like yeah, yeah. over the years, you realize like for me, at least I like the smallest ones, the ones that like have barely open that are so soft and almost like putty. And if they don't look like that or a little older than that, I just pass it up. But as far as newer species and having that fear, not so much anymore, but I guess in the back of my mind, I know what I'm doing. Like, I know I'm eating a wild organism right here. I know I've never eaten this thing before. I know I should be cautious with it. So I'll usually not cook that much of something if it's brand new. That's a good tip. And that's what I recommend to anybody. I mean, <laughs> yeah. and only eat that species and not mix it with like three other brand new ones, just in case. Yeah. But having said that, like the lactarius and the milk cat mushrooms, to me, in my eyes, are generally safe anyway. Mm. Uh, very few of them are really toxic. Of course, I recommend that people know what they're eating before they actually do eat it and be able to properly identify it. But if I would cook, I mean, I've eaten many saffron milk caps and I like them. Uh, we typically find them late summer through fall, typically in association with conifers here in Eastern North America. Mm. But I've been cooking things a newer way. You know, I read this article a couple of years ago. It was like a controversial article on how to cook mushrooms. And there's a chef saying, you know, everybody's doing it wrong. You're told not to add water to mushrooms because they're already so water rich and that can make them soggy. But he was saying, no, you want to actually cook them in water first, mm. almost like boil them for like 10, 15 minutes until the water disappears and then add your fat then. And I was doing it backwards. I mean, I wouldn't even add water. I would just like maybe scrub the top of it with like a, a towel, maybe throw it underneath the sink really quickly if it was really dirty but avoid water at all costs. But now I've switched that. And so I'll cook it in water for maybe 10, 15 minutes until it evaporates and then add the fat afterwards oh. until it gets like pretty crispy. And it's so good. And I do that for almost all of my wild mushrooms right now. And wow. you ensure that you're actually cooking the thing. And it doesn't change. I mean, the texture still is retained as long as you do evaporate all the water and then cook it in your fat. Because that chitin is so durable it doesn't break down easily so it still remains intact you just have to make sure you get all the water out of there but the problem with just cooking it in fat is sometimes people don't cook it long enough and you just keep adding fat and fat and fat because it keeps being absorbed by the fungus like if you're cooking chicken of the woods or a hand of the woods or my talking mushroom or like one of those tougher polypores i found myself sometimes using like half a stick of butter just to cook the thing <laughs> And then yeah. I just realized, no, 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 no. Cook it first in water. Let the water evaporate. That way it is fully cooked. Now you're just browning it a little, a little bit. You're adding flavor, maybe if you're adding butter or ghee. And uh, it just tastes really good that way. And I feel much more comfortable eating mushrooms that are cooked that way because I know that they're fully cooked. So I would do the same thing with that milk cap, actually. I'm so glad you said that because it was only um, 
a few weeks ago, I clicked on a YouTube video, which was, uh, I don't know if it was the same people, but it was obviously somebody playing on the same controversial nature. And, it, you know, the, the picture, the caption, it caught me, right? It had a shed load of uh, views on it. And then it was this guy boiling his normal cut button mushrooms in water, as just as you've described. And I was thinking, oh, but my first thought was, oh, maybe I should do a video like this because I'll get loads of views. But um, but now that you've said that, I'm thinking, oh, this this is legit. And actually, it's super amazing that you've just shared that because, um, you know, anybody who then listens to this is going to, you know, you've just given that method a lot of credibility. So awesome. Yeah, I'm going to try that. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. if it didn't work, I would say, no, I didn't like it, but it works. It almost always works. I think sometimes if you don't let the water evaporate completely, it'll still retain some of that mush. So you have to make sure the water evaporates or just drain it completely and then really squeeze out the water. But I only use enough water to maybe cook it for 10 minutes. And then also with the fat, when I add it in, I only have to add it in once, whereas previously I would have to add it in like four or five times. And I like to brown up the mushrooms a little bit mm. to make them like not crispy, but browned. And so sometimes that'll take an extra 10 minutes to do so. But so you're looking at 20 to 30 minutes to cook these mushrooms, but the end result is just delicious. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so just, just one more fine detail then on that. You only use enough water to boil it off within 10 minutes. So in terms of what does that look like? You've got your mushrooms in a pot. Are you just covering them? Is that pretty much yeah, it? Yeah, it's basically just that? covering it. Okay. Yeah, just covering it. And then I'll alter the heat. Like if it's cooking too rapidly, I'll just turn down the heat a little bit. Uh, if it's not cooking quick enough, I'll turn up the heat. I mean, it's not like an exact no, no. science with all of this. Try uh, but now. as you do it more and more, you'll get better with it. Love it. I'll try that tonight. Um, so what do you find so fascinating about fungi? Big question. I know so many rabbit holes there. Yeah, I mean, what, what, yeah, what, what don't I find fascinating about yeah. them? Uh, I guess for me, the reason I really love them is that, be, is that they were the original organism that kept me tethered to the forest. I got into them, like I said earlier in this conversation, right around the same time I was getting into plants. But I really took a liking towards the medicinal mushrooms, like chaga and turkey tail and maitake. And that was the thing that always kept me wanting to go back into the woods. And I know that's not like a scientific explanation of like what's so fascinating about mushrooms. But to me, that's what was so fascinating about it. It helped me find my passion. And a lot of people like to not give mushrooms enough credit for their medicinal properties and saying, oh, there's not a lot of research on it, or it's a lot of test tube studies both which are not true. I mean, there's a lot of studies on humans and there's a significant amount of research more and more every single year being produced on these uh, mushrooms. But if you could make a pill and give it to somebody and this pill would help somebody find their passion, you would be a billionaire. Like that would be the number one medicine I think that most people would think to find their passion, you know? Yeah. But the mushrooms did that for me. It's like, I found that pill. And it was a medicinal mushroom. So even if it didn't heal anything in my body, I don't believe that's true. I believe it did heal things in my body. Even if it didn't support my immune system, although I do believe it did support my immune system, it helped me find my passion. And it still keeps me aligned to the wood. Like I still love looking for these things. And I know a lot of people will talk about like the mycelial connections with fungi and how they're great decomposers and how they clean up oil spills and how they can alter your perspective and they can alleviate depression and uh, help you quit smoking and help you deal with different addictions. That's all fantastic stuff. But personally speaking in my life, it was to help me find my passion. That's why I love them so much. Nothing else did it for me. Like they win that award for me in my life. Awesome. Um, you mentioned med medicinal mushrooms. I know it is a big, um, big interest of yours. Um, I wondered if you could, um, maybe share what are, what are one or a couple of medicinal mushrooms that are very easy for, you know, if somebody was interested in going out and foraging, not just for mushrooms to eat, but for mushrooms to forage for medicinal purposes, which one should they look to start with? Um, and hopefully it's common in where you are and also common over here as well. But, and then 
what do they then do with it? You know, do they are they just eating it, or how would you prepare or um, preserve uh, those medicinal properties? And also, what does it do for you? Hopefully, I can remember all those questions. Yeah, yeah. I'll... <laughs> so, what I would recommend is that people start with what's growing closest to them. And many times, if you've got wood in your backyard, you probably have medicinal mushrooms growing in your backyard. So, a quick story: back when I was starting foraging i would buy medicinal mushrooms online I'm not saying you shouldn't do this but i just didn't know that they were growing close by and i would buy my taki mushrooms or hen of the woods ripple of frondosa i think they were grown in china maybe and i would send away from them pay a lot of money and i would get them in the mail in this plastic bag and i would take a whiff of it and it would smell very mushroomy and i would just make soups out of it or decoctions or even tinctures and I thought it was the greatest thing. And at the time, it was the greatest thing. And then one day, I got an email from one of my friends who was one of my mentors as well. She was a neighbor. And she said, hey, we found some maitake mushrooms in the city park, which was like two miles away. Just thought you should know. If you want to come looking for them, you can come with us. We'll show you where they are. I had no idea that this rare, exotic, Chinese-derived fungus also grew two miles in the city of Pittsburgh, of all places. Meaning, if it grew in the city of Pittsburgh, where else was it growing? Mm. And so I didn't go to her spot. I just thought, okay, I, I'll learn how to find these things. So you just look at the bases of oak trees, you look around in the autumn season, and you should find them. And I started finding them left and right. And so people don't need, if I, if I recommend a certain mushroom, it doesn't mean you necessarily have to order it online. You can, I mean, for some people who don't have time to find these things. But I think a lot of the medicine is in actually being out in the woods and finding these. Going yeah. back to what I said a couple of minutes ago about being tethered to the woods. How is it not medicine to just experience nature firsthand, getting your hands on the ground, finding something, picking something, bringing that thing home and having a story to tell about it. And that's not saying anything about the sunshine that you might receive or the fresh air, or the people you might run into or the other organisms that you might connect with on that particular day. You can't really say that when you click order from amazon.com and it comes to your house just like that. I'm not knocking people who do that because I do that from time to time as well. So I'm guilty of doing that for many things. But if you have the opportunity and you have the ability to go out and find some of these things, go do it. And so I would just research for, for whoever's listening to this, what are some of the medicinal mushrooms that grow closest to home? Turkey tails are pretty ubiquitous fungus. It grows all around the world in temperate regions. You might have that growing in your backyard or at a local park. I'm not sure what else is so ubiquitous besides that. I mean, shiitake mushrooms are easy to grow. There are some mushrooms that are edible that people don't realize are medicinal, like oyster mushrooms has medicinal potential. Enoki mushrooms, flamulina of alutapes, that has medicinal application as well. And what you can do with these things, it could be as simple as just eating them. And I know you might not be getting all the medicinal compounds just by eating them. But another quick thing you could do is just add them to soups because you're essentially making what's called a hot water decoction where you're adding hot water and letting that thing simmer for some time. Or you could take it a step further and make a dual extracted tincture where you extract it first in alcohol, then you extract it in hot water, then you combine the two and you can take drops of that tincture. And you can carry that with you wherever you go. But there's some good research on the immunomodulating properties of these fungi. They've got beta-glucans that can regulate the immune system in a dual directional way. So these beta-glucans are essentially polysaccharides or long-chain sugars that can stimulate the immune system if it's depressed, but it can also ameliorate inflammation associated with an overactive immune system. This isn't just unique to fungi. There are beta-glucans in plants as well. Uh, so if you go to a health food store, sometimes you'll see beta-glucans in the supplement aisle derived from oats. Oats also have immunomodulating beta-glucans, believe it or not. But it seems like mo a lot of the research today is focusing largely on the fungi, I guess, because they're just so understudied for a long time. And people are excited about the potential that they hold. Amazing answer, by the way. I think you nailed it with those three questions that I threw at you. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask you, what about plants then? Are there any uh, plants from a medicinal perspective that you get excited about going out and finding each year? And, um, and what are those? Or what are one or two of those? Stinging nettle has always been an ally 
of mine. That was probably the first plant that got me interested in foraging. So medicinal mushrooms, that's what really got me into mushrooms. But stinging nettle was like the number one plant. Mm. And I remember digging that thing up. And I'll admit it was from a city park. I don't think you're allowed to do that. But it was a huge, huge patch of it. And the person that told me about this was the same person that told me about this my talking mushrooms. She told me where it was. So I got some and I transplanted it to my house. And it just took over. But I would manage it. You know, I would make sure that it was... Uh, pretty well contained it wasn't taking over completely but if i wouldn't touch it for a month or two this thing would just keep spreading and spreading and spreading but stinging nettle that's another ubiquitous plant almost like turkey tail i mean it doesn't just grow here in north america i'm sure you've got nettles as well and that's a medicinal plant and that plant has largely helped me with seasonal allergies and i released a video in may i think on seasonal allergies and i talked about the benefits of stinging nettle and that how that helps to alleviate symptoms of seasonal allergies. So I love foraging stinging nettle. I love eating it. So it's very versatile. I mean, some people use it for cordage. It's like a utilitarian plant. Some people use it for medicine. Uh, some people use it for food. Some people use it for all three. So that's one of the plants that I really enjoy. And how would someone extract the maximum nutritional and uh, medicinal benefit from it? Is that doing a tincture again or in a soup or something else yeah so i mean if you just want to eat it you could treat it like spinach so yeah. you could just you know add it to a stir fry and just eat it and that'll deactivate the stingers or the trichomes which is what they are how i consume it for seasonal allergies is i make a tea out of it and i guess it's not technically a tea because it's not the tea plant but it's an infusion and i just take the dried material and mm -hmm. put it in a french press for maybe 10 minutes strain it out and then drink it. And I'll drink a couple cups of that a day. Now there's some good research on it in treating BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. And uh, people use the roots or the rhizomes of stinging nettle for that. And I believe people might use a tincture, but I don't have much experience for that because I don't have that condition. But I know there's some good research on that, including double blind randomized placebo controlled trials. Do you ever use stinging nettle for anything or see it? Only occasionally just cooking as an ingredient, but um, and yeah, we see it. It's everywhere. It's pretty. Mm -hmm. It's it's everywhere here. So as I'm sure it is in most places, I guess. A very successful plant. <laughs> but, yeah, it is, and uh, a very malign plant as well. Not many people realize the virtues of stinging that all. I'm glad you explained that because I was about to ask you, um, what do you mean by malign? <laughs> shows my limited vocabulary um trees um you've you've done a lot of stuff about trees and I, I just wanted to ask you um what's your what's your interest um with with trees and why why are they so important for the forager and the mushroom forager so when people get into foraging for mushrooms inevitably you're going to come across information on trees because a lot of mushrooms grow in association with certain trees so every field guide that talks about mushrooms also talks about trees at least somewhere and that's interesting i mean you don't see field guides really talking about bacteria you don't see field guides really talking about plants too much or associations with plants you don't see it talking about associations with maybe ferns or lycophytes or other organisms or reptiles or any kind of animal, but it's always in association usually with some kind of tree or some kind of tree product, whether that's, you know, mulch or wood chips or log or a snag or something like that. And so if you want to become a better mushroom forager, it only makes sense to also learn trees as well. And I'm not saying that there's a proper order in which you should do this. Like, should you forage mushrooms first? Should you learn trees first? What should you do? You could do them both at the same time but it's only going to help you become a better mushroom forager if you also learn trees. And this isn't just true about mushroom foraging, just becoming a better naturalist overall, just becoming a better interpreter and reader of the land, like to be able to look out and determine what the soil might be like or what the history of that land might be like. You can't really do that looking at the mushrooms. In some cases you can, but it's usually going to come back to the trees or maybe it'll come back to the geology of the land. 
but trees are just great indicators of different ecosystem attributes and functions as well. And as a mushroom forager, it's only going to benefit you to learn your trees. And I find that there's a, there's a lack of information out there on tree identification. Yes, there are many field guides out there. Yes, people put videos out there, but there isn't really like one kind of really good course that tells you to discipline yourself to spend time and learn trees in a very disciplined manner. What a lot of people do is they go out and they might go foraging for mushrooms or they might go birding, or they might just take a walk in the woods and they might pick up a tree here or there or wonder about a particular tree or just assume that over the years through osmosis, I'll learn the trees. I tried that for a while and it works, but it's very, very slow. You can expedite this whole process if you just tell yourself, you know, in two years, I'm going to learn all the trees that grow around me. And it's very doable for people like us because where we live, there aren't thousands of species of trees. With mm -hmm. mushrooms, there are. With vascular plants, there are. With insects, there are. But with trees, where I live in Pennsylvania, there's probably 140, 150 native trees and maybe another 50 to 60 introduced trees. That's very doable. That's manageable. That's something that you can achieve in a relatively limited amount of time. And then once you learn this stuff, you can just apply it to so many areas of your nature education. Mushrooms are great. I love mushrooms, but it doesn't really have broad applicability to other nature disciplines. It can, but usually it comes back to the trees. And then you start to read other things in the land based on what you know about trees. And I might sound like I'm biased because I've been focusing on trees for a lot of years and I put out an online course on trees, but I only feel this way because I know the benefits that have accrued to my life because I've studied trees. That's awesome. And so I have to ask you the question, if you were to set us up with the uh, top few tips for a, a mushroom forager, how can they use trees then to go and find, I guess, um, these the most gourmet mushrooms that uh, people are searching for? How can trees help them do it? Which ones are they? And is it just one tree for one mushroom? Or what, what would you say generally? Do you have like a, uh, a quick action guide for somebody as it relates to trees and mushroom foraging and finding these special species that people want to eat? So I would recommend learning which trees are mycorrhizal, which ones. Mm. Okay. So all trees are pretty much mycorrhizal, but I'm talking about the ones that form ectomycorrhizal relationships with fungi you, that produce above ground fruiting bodies. Sorry to interrupt you, but I don't think on this channel we've explained what mycorrhizal is. And I just okay. wonder if before you go down that route, uh, maybe you could just share what that actually means as well. That'd yeah, awesome. sure. So, when we think about fungi, it's important also to think about what are the roles of fungi? Like, what are they doing? They're not just there just because they look pretty. They're actually doing something. They're serving a very important role. But they could be serving any number of roles, three, four, five different roles, not all at the same time and not all of them perform all these roles. Sometimes a mushroom only performs one role. Sometimes a mushroom can perform two roles, sometimes three but there are many different roles that fungi perform. And so when we're going out into the woods and we're looking for mushrooms, generally there are three roles that fungi perform. Number one is a saprotrophic role. A saprotrophic role is an organism like a fungus is breaking down organic material. So sapros means putrid, I believe in Greek. So it's breaking down putrid material. So if you see something growing on a log and the tree is dead, there's a good chance that that fungus is a saprotrophic fungus. Kind of related to saprotrophic is the parasitic role. Again, this is something that is breaking down tissue. But in this case, the tissue that the fungus is breaking down is living. Or the organism is living, I should say. So if you see like a honey mushroom, for example, on a living tree, and it's actually breaking down living tissue, then that would be a parasitic role. And some of these fungi are pretty serious pathogens and forests worldwide. Uh, like another parasitic fungus would be the fungus that causes chestnut blight 
here in North America, which just ravaged most of the chestnut trees here in Eastern North America. And that's not a fungus that actually produces a fruiting body like uh, like an Amanita mushroom. There are small fruiting bodies that you can see, but they're not big and beautiful like those Boletes or Russula mushrooms. But that's a parasitic fungus that destroys chestnut trees. And then there's the mycorrhizal role. And a mycorrhizal role is different in that the mycorrhizal fungus is forming a mutualistic symbiosis with a plant. And so the mycorrhizal fungus is shuttling nutrients to the plant or the tree in exchange for fixed carbon that the tree is producing because fungi need carbon. They're not photosynthesizers. They're kind of like us. We need to obtain our fixed carbon by eating other organisms or by obtaining it through some kind of symbiosis. So the fungi are doing this by shuttling nutrients that the trees aren't very good at acquiring themselves. And it could be water, it could be nitrogen, it could be phosphorus, it could be potassium sending that over to the plant or the tree, the tree is photosynthesizing or the plant is photosynthesizing, sending that over to the fungus. Now, whenever we're going out and looking for edible mushrooms, foragers eat sapotrophic mushrooms, foragers eat parasitic mushrooms, foragers eat mycorrhizal mushrooms. But it seems that a lot of the choice fungi maybe gravitate towards the mycorrhizal side of things. You're thinking about chanterelles, you're thinking about black trumpets, you're thinking about boletes. It's debatable whether morels are mycorrhizal. Some people say they're saprotrophic. Some people say they switch back and forth and they can act as both. And that's another oh, good point. Some that. mushrooms, like armillaria mushrooms, like honey mushrooms, are parasitic. They can also be saprotrophic. And some armillaria mushrooms are mycorrhizal with orchids. Oh, wow. So it's not like every mushroom fits neatly into a package. These categories are things that just humans create. And so mushrooms yeah. don't just follow all the rules that humans create for them. Yeah. So for morels, it's debatable whether they're largely mycorrhizal, largely saprotrophic. Research is ongoing on this particular subject. But I would say whenever you're foraging for mushrooms and you want to be able to pinpoint where certain fungi are, it's important to learn the mycorrhizal trees. Mm. And there aren't that many ectomycorrhizal trees compared to endomycorrhizal so now there's other subcategories with yeah, so can just can you touch on the difference in about? layman's terms just yeah. like the forger yeah an ectomycorrhizal fungus is one that produces the macroscopic fruiting bodies that we see so the bleeds the chanterelles the black trumpets the amanita mushrooms the endomycorrhizal ones don't produce the macroscopic fruiting bodies they're still fungi but they're in the soil and they hook mm -hmm. up with the plant's root system, but they don't produce the macroscopic fruit and bodies. So people will say, well, maple trees, maple trees aren't mycorrhizal. No, they're mycorrhizal, they're just endomycorrhizal. Endo. Uh, so there are numerous species of fungi that hook up with them and help them survive and thrive, but we just don't see a mushroom associated with that endomycorrhizal fungus. So learn the ectomycorrhizal trees. And these would be oaks, and I'm going to leave a lot out here, but just generally yeah. speaking, you've got oaks, you have hickories, you've got pines, all of your conifers, essentially, your pines, your spruces, your firs, your large trees. And then going back to deciduous trees, birches, that's another good one as well. So learn those ones. I mean, there are plenty within those genera because oak isn't just one tree. I mean, there's 500 species of oaks worldwide. So you have your work yeah. cut out for you if you just learn the oak trees. But if you get into those areas, I found over the years that I tend to find more mushrooms in those areas compared to like a maple cherry forest. Because cherry isn't largely an ectomycorrhizal tree, neither is maple. You'll find mushrooms there. You'll find oysters. You'll find chicken in the woods. You might find parasol mushrooms in there. But these aren't the mycorrhizal mushrooms. Mm. I think I My confused a lot of people in the past five minutes. <laughs> no, no. Like, I, I really... Um... I didn't know about the ecto and endo. I'm sure I've learned it somewhere, but that was really good clarification. And my um, marketing brain just kicked off there. And I was thinking, oh, I wish Adam had just created a list of like, here's the, here's all the ecto mycorrhizal trees like named. And you could just have that as a, as a lead magnet. That would, that would catch on my email address. Uh, I think, I think um, you should do that. Something in that. I did well, create a video years ago, though. It's called Seven Trees Every Mushroom Hunter Should Know. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of them are ectomycorrhizal. But I also include elm in there for morels. Uh, I think I might include tulip poplar. That's not largely 
ectomycorrhizal, but it's associated with morels here. So somebody can go watch that video, but you could do the lead magnet. I'll give I'll, you I'll do, I'll do. That. Okay, thank you. Cheers. I will. <laughs> and um, I, I know when we were speaking before, I, I was um, asking you what other things you're pursuing in terms of passionate interests at the minute. And you mentioned invasive species, um, I guess, plants and other things. Uh, can you first of all share like what's what's led you to go down this route of interest and um, what are yeah what's led you to go down this route of interest before I throw another two or three questions at you all at once to so do one at a time this time you know it's interesting when you're a kid and you're looking out at nature you don't really categorize things you just see things the way they are and you don't really put a judgment on things unless you hear another human being talk about it. it's only when you get older when you learn oh, some things are good and some things are bad. And when you hang out in plant circles long enough, you start to realize that what's good is native. What's bad is non-native. And mm. people conflate non-native with invasive a lot. There's a lot of different terminology used to describe these plants. But this is a concept that's actually fairly new. I mean, people have been talking about nativeness in different contexts for a very long time. But as far as plant and animal and insect ecology. This is like the 1980s, maybe early 1990s. And you realize that people are very emotional when it comes to talking about this stuff. And so over the years, I've put out videos. Like as a forager, I don't really judge plants based on their origin as much as I do on their edibility. Mm. That's just like my lens as a forager. And so I would put out something on maybe Audible. This is a shrub that was brought over here uh, in the 1800s, I think first as an ornamental, and then it was used by the US government to rehabilitate damaged land. And it quickly spread. And I mean, it grows in many, many different places, usually in abandoned farms and uh, abandoned fields as well, or in very disturbed landscapes, but it produces a delicious berry that humans can eat. And it's very nutritious. It's got, according to the research, up to 17 times the lycopene content of tomatoes. And back in the day, maybe 10 years ago, lycopene was like the star nutrient. A lot of people were talking about this nutrient called lycopene for its antioxidant properties, uh, for its anti-cancer properties, and talking about, yeah, eat tomatoes, and specifically eat tomato sauce, and you'll get lycopene. Well, it turns out there's a shrub that grows around here that supposedly has 17 times the amount of lycopene. But I soon learned that I can't say that without offending some people, because that's me talking about the benefit of a plant that's supposed to be very bad here in North America. And that confused me. And I didn't really think anything of it. And then I would put out another video, maybe on something called Japanese angelic tree. This is another non-native plant that was brought over, I think in the 1800s as an ornamental and the same story, you know, now it's kind of spreading, far, spreading out and it's taking over, but it produces a delicious shoot that you can harvest in the spring. So I put out a video and I said, yeah, this, it's a very cool plant too, because it's got all these thorns on it. If you grab, it's actually technically prickles, but if you grab it, like it'll hurt. But the shoots are delicious if you catch them in the early spring. So I put out the video and then some people email me and say, you do know that this plant is invasive. Like, yeah, you know, you shouldn't be really promoting a plant that's invasive. People might mistake this information and plant it or worse I, like, I don't know maybe propagate it somehow and recommend it to other people and that's not my intention at all when i'm talking about this i'm just saying eat thing you know because it's very yeah, yeah. delicious and it saves you from going to the grocery store saves on all that plastic that you would have to purchase and it's a way to connect to your local landscape if the thing is growing where you live and so i started realizing over and over and over again that you can't even talk about benefits of something if it's non-native and so I just started digging more into it and questioning things. And recently I put out a video on invasive species and just asking some questions because I find that a lot of people think that the problem can be resolved if we just pull them all out or if we just broadcast herbicide out there or just let the public know how bad these things are. But I don't think people really shine a light on themselves and see how they're actually contributing to all this. Like if people actually think that these things are really bad, and maybe they're right. I'm not saying that invasive plants are good, but I'm also not saying that they're like the worst thing in the world either. But if people truly feel that they're bad, 
I don't think the right approach is to just treat the symptom. I mean, there's a cause as to why these things are actually moving around the world. And our actions determine why these things are moving around the world. So here in North America, before there were invasive plants, this is going back to like the 1400s, because 1492 is the cutoff here. It's when Columbus came over here. And mm. I'm putting discovered in quotes, but that's what our textbook said when we were growing up. So the 1400s, but in the 1400s, there weren't invasive, there weren't only native plants here in North America because the people living here were managing the invasives. That's not why there were no invasives here. There were no invasives here because our culture didn't support such rapid transport of goods and services around the world where plants could hitch a ride or insects could hitch a ride or animals could hitch a ride on this. Surely these organisms have been moving around for a long time, but it's been a much slower process. Yeah. So I think we have to keep in mind that invasives weren't on the North American continent. And it wasn't because humans were managing the invasives. Their lifestyle just didn't support the movement of these organisms. Today, we kind of have it backward. We want to manage all these things, but we don't address the lifestyle that's actually causing these organisms to move around the world. And I'm not so sure that we can because globalization, intercontinental trade, transcontinental trade, all of this is associated with great things for sure, but it's also associated with consequences like the movement of organisms around the world. And so I don't have any answers here. I just like to question things because people think that the second greatest threat to biodiversity is invasive species. Wow. Like if you read research articles, number one is habitat destruction. Number two is invasive species. But if you dig even deeper into the research, you read that a lot of ecologists and biologists actually don't support that. They say, no, that's not true. There's no quantifiable data to say that's actually the second cause of biodiversity loss in the world today. And so because people are questioning it, I like to bring attention to that other side that is questioning something that seems so foundational in ecology today. The theory that native is good, invasive is bad, invasive is horrible for biodiversity. But again, I'm not an ecologist. I'm not a PhD student. I'm, I don't have any direct research on this particular subject. I just like to shed some light on all sides of a particular story and let people know what some other people are thinking. And some people don't like when I do that but I can't help it. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a, it's a really good approach, really good mindset to have. And it's very relatable and transferable to all of the other stuff that's going on at the world at the minute and how, you know, the media is forcing X, Y, Z down our throats, but actually it's a biased opinion. Right. And there's not very many voices on the other side of things. Like we won't go into it here, but you know, I think it's um, yeah, it's, it's commendable and uh, very interesting. And uh, thank you. And so my next question for you then is what are some of the more special mushrooms or plants you found recently? So years ago, I was working as a dishwasher in a grocery store. And this is when I was first getting into like actually studying and being intentional with nature. And I knew there was a guy who worked in the grocery department he was into birds. He was really into birds. And so I would have a bird feeder outside of my apartment where I lived in the city of Pittsburgh. And I would watch the birds come and go. And I really didn't know many of them. I think I knew robins. I knew cardinals. I knew blue jays. I didn't know many birds beyond that. Like, seriously, a lot of this was new to me, even as an adult. That's how nature deprived I was, or nature illiterate I was. And a bird came to the feeder one day, and I had my flip phone. <laughs> And I took a picture of it, like a real grainy photo of it. And I thought, this looks like a really special bird. And I didn't know what it was, though. And so I thought, this guy who works in the grocery department, he'll know. So the next day I worked, I saw him. And I said, hey, I got this picture of this bird. And I want to know what you think about it. And I pulled open the flip phone and I showed him a picture. And he looked at it. And he said, that's a downy woodpecker. And to me, I was like, I know what, what's a downy? I know what a woodpecker is, but what's a downy woodpecker? And I asked him, I said, oh, is it special? And he looked at me and he answered with only three words. 
But those three words have stuck with me ever since. My question was, is it special? And he looked at me and he said, they're all special. And I thought, what a perfect answer. Mm. And nowadays, a lot of people ask me about like, what's my favorite or what's the most important or what's the most special organism that I found. And even when we go on a walk, people will pick up something. They'll say, oh, look at this. Is it special? And I'm always brought back to that conversation with that guy. And I answer with the same exact answer that he answered with. They're all <laughs> special. They are. And so I know a lot of people do have like a favorite mushroom or the most important mushroom for them. But I do believe that they're all special. So going back to the whole invasive thing, as a forager, first, it's hard to demonize a plant that produces a lot of food. Like to demonize what you're about to eat just seems weird to me. Like, oh, this plant is horrible, but I'm going to eat it. Like that's got to do something bad for your body inside to demonize such a thing. Mm. But as far as like, what is my favorite mushroom or what's important? I really do think that they're all special and that they're all important. And it goes back to that conversation that I had with that guy in the grocery store. And I don't even think he realizes it. I've never kept in touch with him, but he radically transformed my life by answering the question about a downy woodpecker, which is like the most common woodpecker around here. And I don't know if he didn't have the heart to say to a newbie like me, yeah, this is like the most common woodpecker. So no, it's not special at all. But he said, they're all special. You know, we tend to look for the rare things or the very colorful things or the big and beautiful as being special things. But even the most common bird that can be found around here can be super special. That's a great story. So they're all special. And, a, and a good message. And um, it brings us on nicely to our, rapid fire questions at the end and guess what the first one was going to be but now i'm going to rephrase it now <laughs> uh, I, can, not... I mean i can answer <laughs> no, 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 it after no. providing that disclaimer no let me rephrase it because um there is definitely a better way i can ask the question um so or maybe i'll answer the question myself first like what's my favorite mushroom at the moment i think to find um and i think it depends obviously what time of the year obviously because some out at different times but um i think i'm just gonna pause there because these are just about to die so i'm just gonna hopefully these Great answers, by the way, mate. I'm not sure. I can't hear what you're saying at the moment, but. <laughs> Says it's connected, but. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. So the so people are gonna see your headphones change like one scene to the next. And I'm not Go gonna on. say anything either. They're gonna be like, oh <laughs> if they're still watching that is yeah, well, this will be a good <laughs> we'll we'll know who's sticking around or not. <laughs> exactly. Um okay, cool. Um what was I even saying? Favorite mushroom. Yeah, so my favorite mushroom to find probably, um, I don't know, uh, towards the beginning of summer, during summer. And I think it also, the, the excitement I get from seeing this mushroom probably does almost beat the excitement of seeing any other mushroom, probably because there's no, there's not that many mushrooms around at the time. And, and it is chicken of the woods, you know, I think, and the part of the reason why I like it is because and it's not my favorite mushroom to eat, but uh, it is my one of my favorite mushrooms to find because I can find myself walking, usually with with Danny. And it took me a few years, but I got her into mushroom foraging. So whenever we go walking now, both of our necks by the end of it are craned because like she's down looking left and I'm down looking right, going down the path. But the good thing about for me finding chicken in the woods is you can see it from a country mile away, and sometimes it's like 
it's almost like laser focused through about 50 different oak trees and you've just got this glint, glint of orange and it's like whoa there's chicken in the woods and uh, I don't know the thrill and the rush that I get from seeing that is uh is massive um and I think it yeah it's probably my most exciting mushroom to find not my most um the one that I like to eat the most that's I think for me at the moment that's the the, the cauliflower fungus and I've I've had a few things happen this season already. I've gone back to the same mushroom spots, patches where I've seen some big ones um, in just, because we've recently moved about two years ago. So we kind of only had one season here. So I have one season where I found a few spots of these relatively close by. And um, I went back to the these same patches and I did see these cauliflower funguses growing. So I was like, great, small, good sign. But they were like, you know, babies. So I was like, oh, okay, we're just going to let them grow. So I'd like, you know, dragged some branches over them because they were not that far away from the path. And I've sprinkled some leaves over them. Um, and so, like, I've done that with three different patches and they were all babies and I tried to cover them up. But I've gone back to all three patches and somebody has found them and somebody has taken them. And I was like devastated. So I, I now need to find some new cauliflower fungus, which is probably my my most enjoyable to eat. Although if I, gosh, I could just talk about this all day. But um, if I had could find more uh, hen of the woods, because I've gone back to my spots where I've seen that last year as well. And there's, there's just none growing in, in on the oak trees that were producing massive flushes last year. And there's just none there this year. And I know they're out and about because all the other local people or, or friends of mine are, are posting and seeing them so but I really do like the taste of that as well um for just eating so they would be my couple of mushrooms and of course all the the, the really nice beliefs and um I love a good bay belief um even over a sep you know I really do um but yeah what so let me rephrase the question then to not what's your favorite mushroom or, or particularly not what the most special mushroom you like to find but which mushroom or mushrooms give you a bigger buzz when you find them so this might sound like repetitive <laughs> and boring to a lot of people because i've already talked about this mushroom oh but again i'm not somebody i thought you're about excited. to say they all give me a buzz <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're all special and they I mean, all give me a buzz you have certain ones <laughs> give you a buzz more than others yeah, but yeah. my yeah the one that i like going back to what i said earlier there are a lot of mushrooms out there that are edible, like way more that are edible or benign than ones that will kill you. But I don't really get excited about like the 54th edible mushroom on my list or even like the 38th most favorite edible mushroom. There's really just like a handful that I really, really love. And this is speaking, I'm, I'm speaking based on the experience of eating a lot of different wild mushrooms, but it's hand of the woods or maitake, griffola frondosa. I just love that one. It's one that I became attracted to very early on, and I love the versatility of it. I love the texture of it as well. I love how it's, although it does harbor a lot of uh, like crustaceans and salamanders and sometimes snakes and insects in there, wow, it doesn't really tend to get buggy in the same way that like a bolit would get buggy, where you tend to see like lots of maggots in there. But the quantity of food that you can get from that mushroom is astounding the medicinal potential of it is astounding as well and it stores incredibly well i dehydrate my surplus and it'll last for years if you store it properly i can't say that about a lot of other mushrooms yeah there's certain ways to preserve other mushrooms but you might not get the quantity of food that you get from my taki or it's just as tasty to forage you know another like a bolete mushroom or maybe a chanterelle but the medicinal potential of hand of the woods is just so much greater and so i keep coming back to that one i love the taste i love the texture i love how it stores well i love the abundance that it produces and i love the time of year that it fruits as well autumn season is just a beautiful time to be out in the woods a quick question on that um and and also i was also going to say it's got a great latin name as well that just brings me straight back to harry potter i don't know about you but um so i have I, we haven't spoken about this but i'm co-hosting a um mushroom event in here in the uk called the uk truffle festival 
and uh, we're also doing a truffle dog championships and stuff. But one of the things that we're looking to do from the foodie perspective on the day is have a bit of like a medicinal mushroom tea bar type of thing. And uh, just on the, this is the other reason why I'm trying like mad to hunt for some uh, hen of the woods, but what would be the the best way um, that you suggest we should prepare that and deliver that in maybe like a tea format? Um, is it simply just dehydrating and then stewing? Like what, what would you do if you were going to? So I'll be honest with you. I don't like it in tea form. Right. Okay. It's great as a soup though. Mm. If you want to make like a hot, like savory dish with it. Yeah. I think definitely. that would be ideal. It's great as a tincture. Actually, it's delicious as a tincture. There's something about making a maitake tincture. It's like almost caramel flavor. I don't know what it is, but every single batch of Hand of the Woods tincture that I've made almost has like a sweet taste to it. So that's very good. But if you want to serve it as food, pickling is also a great option. I don't know if you've ever pickled mushrooms before, but Hand of the Woods pickles incredibly well. And there's a couple of good recipes online on how to pickle. But as far as the tea, in my opinion, the best tasting fungus tea is chaga. Yeah. Because it I doesn't taste you. mushroomy. It doesn't taste bitter, really. I mean, it might be slightly astringent, maybe slightly tannic. But it's not bitter like, uh, like Ganoderma, like some of the reishi mm. or reishi mushrooms. Those ones tend to be pretty bitter. With Hand of the Woods, has like a real mushroomy taste and so as a tea i personally i don't really like that i'd rather have it as a soup and add some herbs to it or maybe some potatoes or something and make it a mm. nice hearty soup that's such a, that's, that's a great that's shout. how i'd recommend serving that thank you that is a great shout and um brilliant we'll avoid probably doing that then um in terms i mean of you tea. might be different though make a tea and see if you like it but it tends to be really earthy and mushroomy but not in a Which to way. me almost tastes more like a soup. Oh, okay, I'm with you. Um, the other thing I was going to quickly ask you, rapid fire wise, is um, in the whole wild, wild food um, larder, um, are there any sort of recipes or food projects that either you're currently doing like right now, or you've got, you know, in the works that you're going to be working on in terms of a new recipe, a new, a new project, whether it's pickling, fermenting, or just cooking like or with a new ingredient anything, anything that you can share so i've been really getting into cider making with wild apples and also making meads so mead is basically a honey wine and then you can add fruit to it and i know there's a different term for that when you ever add fruit but it's still at its heart a mead I love doing that kind of stuff. I've been doing it for a couple of years, but I've been getting better and better at it and doing it more and more because as somebody who's very interested in health and nutrition, I'm very interested in foraging fruits and berries and things that are sweet, but I don't really like consuming a lot of sugar. And if you look at recipes for a lot of this stuff, like any kind of fruit or berry or something sweet, it's usually, and I know that the intention is to preserve it, but also they add a lot of sugar to things and making jams yeah. and jellies and marmalades and sweet things. It's not to say I never consume those things or I don't appreciate what those things can do because you can preserve a lot of food that way. But what I do when I make meads or ciders is I do the opposite. I take all the sugar out. It's the exact opposite. You get all the benefits of this phytonutrients without any of the sugar, because whenever I make a meat or a cider, I ferment it all the way. So it's completely yeah. dry. But I love doing that. It's a great way to preserve your harvest. And if you're somebody who doesn't mind consuming alcohol every now and then, and I don't think alcohol is the devil if you can consume it intentionally. And I mean, I don't drink a lot. It might be one glass a month, maybe. But I like bringing it to engagements or to parties where I know people would appreciate it. And usually people aren't making a lot of this stuff. So whenever you bring it to like a party, people are like, what the heck is that? Like, how did you make this? And so there's always a story attached to it as well. But that's what I've been most excited about lately. That's like my go-to for preserving a lot of wild foods. Nice. I, I did a, in, the, in wanting to do a cider myself, I did attempt something earlier in the year, but not with wild apples, because obviously it wasn't seasonal. I just used some 
best organic apple juice that I could find and let it let it go. But like I was just wanting to ask you then, um, like roughly and simply, what what's your little process for doing that then with wild apples? So mine is uh, kind of tedious because I don't have all the equipment that I would like to have. And I use a juicer, a Jack okay. LaLanne juicer. And if anybody knows what a Jack LaLanne juicer is, you're probably laughing right now. But you can look it up online. I mean, this is like one of those infomercial type juicers that you could order in like the 1990s. But I've had one because I used to juice a lot of fruits and vegetables. And I know an apple press is ideal. I do have an apple press, but it's a smaller one. So I can't put a lot of apples in there. And so to work around it, I just juice all the apples first. So basically you're just getting raw apple juice. And then you put that into a carboy. Actually, before I put it into a carboy, I put it into a big crock and let that thing ferment. And so I don't add any yeast to any of my mm. ferments. I think I've only done it once whenever I couldn't get a ferment going. But there's a great book called How to Make Mead Like a Viking by Jeremy Zimmerman. And he basically talks about how you can just like let something sit out and let the yeast that's naturally in the air or on the fruits just start that fermentation process naturally. So as somebody who's into wild organisms, of course, I would appreciate somebody who's also using wild yeast as well. So I don't add any yeast to my ciders. I know it could be more unpredictable when you do something like that, but I like the unpredictability of it. I love mm. not quite knowing how it's going to end up. Then you open up that bottle months later and it's just, it just blows your mind sometimes. And so I let that thing ferment in a vat for a while. And it only takes maybe 24 hours sometimes if it's warm enough outside if I used enough apples with yeast on them. And then I transfer those, uh, that juice that's already fermented slightly to a carboy, put the airlock on it. And it takes maybe three or four weeks in order to uh, eat up all the sugars that are in there. And then I bottle it, put them in bottles. And maybe a month later, I'll start to drink some of that. Nice. Have you done a but video? That's how I make cider. Cool? No, I haven't. No. I haven't done any videos on mead no. making or cider making. And I think it's because my process isn't the best because I do use a juicer. <laughs> yeah. And I honestly, I don't recommend it for people. People like to see the, the, the bad bits, right? Even the, the, the ugly. I mean, it's, it's pretty scenes. funny. It takes a lot yeah. of time, but it's just what I have available right now. Yeah, I, yeah. Don't, I don't have all but the equipment. When, that when I you have a have commercial ideally. juicer, you'll be ready to go and get on camera. Is that big? Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm with you. But I, I, don't, I don't mind the hard work that I unnecessarily do to make cider makes it taste nicer i guess yeah we've got we're fortunate you know here in pennsylvania there were a lot of apple orchards that were abandoned and then just they became essentially like feral apples feral apple trees and so a lot of the state parks actually were formerly apple orchards or if you go into some areas of pennsylvania you'll see where the old apple orchards were so you could forge a lot of these so i have a mix of both uh what i guess would be domestic apples and crab apples in my ciders and it's good it's a great way to get the benefits of apples without the sugar it's got my uh mouth watering i can tell you and i think i might have to pop to the shops and go and get a cider or something later <laughs> but um it is approaching that time but yeah i think that's a lovely a lovely place to, to end to be honest and um i just want to um ask ask you is if you know where where else can people listening find out more information about what you're up to um you know learn your land like what, what's coming up um what's what's in the pipeline and things like that because i know people you know be wanting definitely be going to check out you know more of your stuff because you know you're obviously very knowledgeable in all of this stuff and um a, a deep resource for people to uh, get more learnings from so yeah where, where can people find out more about what you're up to the easiest way to stay in touch would be to go to the website, which is learnyourland.com and then sign up for the email newsletter. So I have an email newsletter. I only send maybe one or two emails a month unless I'm promoting a course. And in that case, I'll probably send a couple more emails per month, but I don't abuse my privilege of having your email address and sending you relevant information. So that's the best way. I mean, I have a YouTube channel, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, uh, but email is probably the best way to stay in touch. Nice. And you've also got your tree identification course coming up. Is that because I know, obviously, the trees are in your area. Are you are you promoting this as something that um, people outside of um, 
uh, I forgot how to say the state that you're in. Is Pennsylvania? Yeah, correct. Is it is it relevant to people beyond Pennsylvania, or or what, what do you think? Yeah, so the geographic range is mostly eastern North America, more of a focus on the temperate regions of eastern North America. Because once you get down into Florida, which is southeastern United States, you get into some like somewhat tropical kind of habitats. It's a little different down there. So, I mean, it, it just doesn't really apply worldwide. I didn't create a product that could be globalized, but I'm okay with that because yeah. learn your land, the your and learn your land is learn the land where you live. And I would not be following my own advice if I would create a product that would apply in like Turkey or India or in British Columbia. I'm sure those are great places. I've been to a couple of them, but learn your land is about learning the land where you live. So I live on the eastern side of North America. So fortunately for the people here, you can apply this information where you live. Unfortunately for people who don't live here, I guess you'll have to take whatever advice I can generalize, which is not that much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I imagine even even in the UK, there must be a hell of a lot of overlap. But um... there is, I mean, there, and with the online course with the tree course, I mean, I spend a good portion of time just talking about tree biology, ecology, taxonomy, which really has nothing to do with specifics of tree identification. Mm. So you would find benefit in that. And I mean, the oak genus, it's got a worldwide distribution. You'll find birches, worldwide distribution, so a lot of other trees as well. But a lot of the particulars that I focus on in the course do apply only here. Awesome. And um, I know you've been working on this course for quite a long time. And so what, what's next? What, what's your, going to be your focus next? Are you having a break or are you just going to pump out more videos or is there, a, is there a next phase for Learn Your Land? Yeah, so I'm currently in that limbo between the project and what's next. Yeah. And I'm actively trying to accept what is coming down yeah, yeah. the pike, but I haven't come up with anything yet. But I'm having fun. You know, it's a lot of work to put out that course. It's two and a half years of basically... Mm. 10 to 12 hour days. The last couple of months were just all work, like literally no play, all work to get that thing out. So it's been fun to, I mean, I'm not like relaxing entirely right now because I still put out a lot of content on YouTube. I still write a lot of emails. I still research a lot and study a lot and go out into the woods and try to observe a lot. But as far as big projects, I'm not quite sure, but I'm open to ideas. So if anybody has an idea, please let me know. Sweet. Awesome. Well, Adam, thank you. Thank you so much again. Uh, and it's it's been an absolute pleasure. And if there's anything I could do for you in the future, and I'd love to stay in touch. And uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ben. It was a real pleasure to be on your podcast, even though we didn't talk about truffles. <laughs> I hope that was okay. <laughs> Next time. I, I, actually, I actually do have um, a couple of truffles here wrapped in tin foil. Um, cause, not because I found them, unfortunately, not yet. But um these were given to me by uh, Melissa, who is the lady I'm doing this event with, and she is a proper truffle hunter. They're only small, um, and I've cut it in half. Um, but this is a, uh, I believe it's a tuba estevum, which is like the mm. British, the summer um, autumn truffle. Um, it's gone past it a little bit, but it's still good enough for dog dog training. She gave us two, and we had one on. Um, just I just completely shaved the whole thing on some poached eggs and it was really nice I think there is a video on my Instagram of it but uh soon hopefully um this season uh, I think it's going to be a crazy time when I all my energies in terms of mushroom foraging and stuff at the moment is looking to find that one first uh truffle at the moment I think I'm going to have a really good celebration when I do but um yeah all good yeah it's great I don't have much experience foraging truffles We've got some here in Eastern North America. Mostly it's a West Coast thing, a Pacific Northwest. But it's not something that I've, I've never had like a mentor take me out and show me the ropes. You don't find a lot of truffle hunters out here where I live. Uh, but maybe I'll come out there one day and you can show me the ropes. 100%. 100%. Cool. All right. Take care for now and I'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Ben.